John Bush here with the Unconventional Living Tour podcast update. This time, day seven. We we're in San Diego, California. I delivered a speech at Libertopia Festival about Freedom Cells, a peer to peer mutual aid society. And I talked about how we can use blockchain technology to augment the creation of an alternative means of social organization. And this is that speech that I delivered. There's a series of podcasts and interview speeches we're going to be putting out. Uh, the first one was Catherine Blige's speech. Coming up, we'll have an interview with Paul Fway, the CEO of Airbits, Paige Peterson of Project Safe, and Bob Podolsky of the Titania Society. Those will be coming out shortly, so look for those. I want to give you our magic word for today's podcast. In the speech, I reference that our movement has strength in three areas. I say strength in blank, strength in blank, and strength in blank. Today's magic word is those three words. Those three words with a space between each one is the magic word for the day seven Unconventional Living Tour West podcast update. Follow us along at unconventional.com. We got a live blog. Cat is constantly updating with great pictures. And I want to remind you of our gift promo code, Uncoin14. Uncoin14. The number is 14. And if that's your first time to purchase gift cards through gift, gyft.com with Bitcoin, you'll get $5 back on any $25 purchase. So that's Uncoin14. Also want to thank our sponsor, Cheap Air. Expect an interview soon uh, with their CEO, Jeff Klee. Sat down with him recently. That's cheapair.com. And finally, we want to thank Airbits, airbits.co, business directory and wallet. Without further ado, folks, Here's a speech I gave to Libertopia on freedom cells augmented with blockchain technology. Hello, how is everybody today? Good. Give it up for peace and freedom! Don't forget justice. So my name's John Bush. I'm an activist. been um, agitating for the creation of a free society for a little over a decade now. And we've experimented with all sorts of means of accomplishing this. Some fruitful, most not. And I've come up with kind of a synthesis on what I feel and my belief would probably be one of the best strategies we can implement as individuals and collectively in order to find liberty in our lifetime. And it's called Freedom Cells. And it's very similar to a lot of the ideas that are being discussed uh, by Bob Podolsky and, and others. And I want to talk about that, but I also want to talk about the concept of Freedom Cells and the broader concept of four planks, four components that I see as extremely worthwhile if we are to create a genuinely free society, uh, absent hierarchical, institutionalized, legitimized coercion. And those four planks, I believe, are education. That's educating people about the philosophy of liberty, about self-ownership, non-aggression principle, uh, educating people and piercing through the veil of legitimacy that public officials and law enforcement officers enjoy. The second aspect is the creation and promotion of alternative institutions, those institutions that are rooted in mutually beneficial voluntary association as opposed to uh, coercive hierarchical relationships. And the third component would be the freedom cell concept. And then the fourth component finally is what some would call political, but I would call it diplomacy. And that's gathering our community, asserting our sovereignty, and effectively letting those state actors know that we no longer wish to participate in their institution and we're going to assert ourselves uh, to the fullest in order to achieve not only freedom but also peace where we don't constantly have to be looking over our shoulder uh, to the boogeyman coming to attack us or take our rights away. So when I speak about education, uh, again I'm referring to the non-aggression principle, the idea that it's wrong or unethical to aggress against others. I think in discussing this concept with non-liberty-minded folk, uh, there could be some appeal. Most people find it objectionable to be forced to participate in institutions that they don't agree with. For example, many uh, liberal-minded or progressives may not appreciate the idea of funding foreign wars of aggression. Likewise, many conservative-minded individuals may not appreciate their tax dollars uh, funding abortions taking place. And I think there's an opportunity to get people to think about things consistently, perhaps. Like, okay, I think it's wrong for you to be forced into this, but can you please have the mutual respect for me to not force me into that which I disagree with? 
and I have a, you know, a lot of things that are immoral. Anybody that's being forced into participating in funding any type of thing that they don't agree with uh, is wrong and should be stopped. So those are some of the ideas that I think would be important to discuss. Also the concept of self-ownership. We own ourselves and we ought not to be made to do things that we don't want to do of our own fruition. And then finally, we ought to really focus on piercing through the veil of legitimacy that the state enjoys, which is why, precisely why, I see so many police brutality videos and so many officers literally get away with murder and they're not held accountable because they have the veil of legitimacy and the public believes de facto that because they have a badge or because they have a title of nobility that they can do no harm and if they are doing wrong then they're not held accountable. Many of them even have sovereign immunity. So I think it's important that we encourage people to look at law enforcement officials or anyone with a bag or title of nobility, senator, even bureaucrats. They're just the same as all of us. We're all on equal footing. None of us have more rights than others. And I think in doing so, we can lift that veil. And perhaps when a police officer or law enforcement official is murdering or engaging in theft with other people, when people resist, they won't be locked up and put in prison. There's a I think it was a Lysander Spooner joke. I told it to a police officer once as they towed my car away in the Skokie County of Oklahoma uh, for expired tags. I said, can I tell you a joke, officer? What's the difference between a highwayman and a police officer, a highway robber and a police officer? He said, well, I don't know. And I said, at least when the highway robber pulls you over and steals your things, he doesn't say he's doing it for your own good. And it completely went over his head. And I had to literally break it down to him. By this time, they already told us they weren't they were going to be towing our car, so uh, just let them have it, essentially. Uh, but I do believe there's a big difference between public criminals and private criminals, and that main difference is with private criminals, you can put up resistance, you can defend yourself, you can stop them from aggressing upon you or others, and sometimes you'll be seen as a hero. But if you try to do the same thing with public criminals, uh, you'll potentially be killed or seen as a felon. And I think it's important for those who value the ideals of liberty and self-ownership to do everything we can to convince people that we ought not to just de facto give someone the benefit of the doubt because they are a public official. So that's the first claim. And education comes in all sorts of ways. And there's books and podcasts and talking to people on the street face to face is probably the most effective. Uh, there's a whole gambit of, of things that we can communicate to one another. But the important part, I think, is that we all do our role in doing that. And everyone by here is obviously doing that by virtue of being here. The second thing is the creation of alternative institutions, and this can be in any different type of area or area of social organization. Uh, when it comes to food, we should grow our own food or participate in local community gardens, not rely on centralized institutions. This is the philosophy that we like to push uh, with Sovereign Living, which is a uh, reality show my wife and I put together. We'll be screening it later tonight, 6.30 or so. Uh, the idea that we shouldn't be dependent on centralized or coercive institutions. So food is a great area. We can build alternative institutions of of healthcare, we don't have to rely on uh, the central, the medical industrial complex, the pharmaceutical industrial complex. Alternative institutions of communication, encrypted peer-to-peer -peer channels of communication, creating alternative uh, means of internet using blockchain technology to accomplish that, like with the Project Safe. Uh, other ways are alternative institutions of justice, which could just be simply uh, rather than going to civil courts, go to arbiters and, and uh, the town wise man or the town council. Uh, alternative institutions of defense are extremely important. Rather than relying on the police or calling the police to solve your disputes with your neighbors, we should uh, rely on each other, community watch groups, uh, militias, some people might call them. Uh, there's all sorts of alternative institutions. I think we should be in the business of creating them, whether it's voluntary mutual aid, community style, or entrepreneurial ventures that seek to fulfill our collective wants and needs and to solve our common problems outside of, again, this government centralized top-down hierarchical system. So not only should we build these institutions and participate in them, of course, the alternative institutions of uh, economics, Bitcoin is a, is a primary example of anarchy in action. Um, but we should uh, promote the hell out of them and let people know that these institutions will solve our common problems, fulfill our wants and needs more effectively, efficiently, justly, and equitably than those institutions which rely on centralizing and coercive hierarchies. So that's the second plank. Education, the creation and promotion of alternative institutions. This other concept I've been kicking around that's been around for centuries, I'm not the first one to come up with it, is this idea of freedom cells or peer-to-peer -peer decentralized mutual aid networks. Uh, I guess it was probably a couple years ago, I started seeing this concept over and over. 
and started, I, I was kind of kicking the idea around in my head, because I've been involved with political activism for about five or six years, and really it bore no fruit when it came to me experiencing more freedom. Every time we would have a small victory, in reality, we weren't reducing the size and scope of the state, rather we were just slightly uh, pushing back on its further expansion. And every time we held it from expanding just one step forward towards more government, it seems like it had already gone 100,000 steps forward in multiple layers, international, federal, uh, state, local, all the way down the line, down the gambit. Uh, so I felt like we were banging our heads against our wall, uh, the wall. I met my lovely wife, Catherine Blige, and she really started hammering that, that concept home that perhaps we should try something different than begging other people to change their behavior. Perhaps we should take a look in the mirror and change our own behavior. And if we want to build a free society, we should take steps and engage in actions that are consistent with the philosophy of liberty, not relying on these centralized institutions. So since then, I've been exploring the revolutionary market anarchism known as agorism or agorism, uh, which is essentially the idea that rather than competing within the system, we should compete with the system and build all new systems and engage in black market and gray market activities. Black market being those activities which are prohibited by the state, gray market being those activities which in order to engage in, you have to first ask permission. And so I've been trying to formulate strategies that we can put all of this into play, not just talk about it. And I've also come to realize that a lot of people may be unwilling to take that next step from philosophizing to actually living the philosophy because uh, out of fear. Uh, and that's righteous fear. We all should be very afraid of what's happening in our world. Uh, the police brutality videos, people having their children taken away, people being locked up for engaging in medical cannabis. It's wrong, it's depressing. I have two young children, one of them just turned three, the other one's 18 months, and I certainly don't want them to grow up with the fear that I've had in my heart growing up. You know that little stutter you get in your heart when the sirens behind you or the police lights behind you? I, I think that's wrong. I don't want my children to grow up feeling the insecurity I do sometimes. Sometimes we go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the state and we put ourselves in, in the way when we're cop-watching and all that stuff. But when you want to avoid the man and the man just won't let you go, like Ernie Hancock says, there's two types of people in this world. Those who want to be left alone and those who just won't leave you alone. Um, so I've been realizing that there's a lot of fear, and what can we do to overcome the fear? Well, there's strength in numbers, and we can all be empowered and more bold in the assertion, the expression of our sovereignty if we have numbers, if we have people united behind us. So enter the concept of freedom cells. Essentially, uh, it's the idea that we ought to organize and form affinity groups, what I call the inner cadre, with groups of eight to 12 of your closest peers, friends, or family, or fellow activists. And in this group, we dedicate ourselves to one another, to being there for one another, should we come under fire from the state, or should the state wanna come collect or haul us away for victimless crimes, but also being there for one another, not just in the resistance of the state capacity, but more importantly, in mutual aid, helping one another. If someone loses their job, we invite them to come stay on our couch. If someone uh, has a problem, a medical problem, they can't afford the medical bills, we, we help fund that, uh, their, their surgery or whatever it may be. So we take this group of 8 to 12, and also at the 8 to 12 level, we can come up with goals that we work towards together. And we've started this concept. We tried a group of 8 to 12, an affinity group. It didn't go as planned. We had some interpersonal conflict, which is extremely, probably the hardest thing to work through. Even conflict with the state is conflict with our friends and family, unfortunately. Um, but in this group of 8 to 12, we set the goal, four goals, the first of which was we should all have three months of food storage and water storage on hand, and we should help each other to do that. And this can be done practically by getting discounts for buying food in bulk. The second goal is everybody in the group of 8 to 12, the affinity group, the inner cadre, should have a firearm and know how to use it safely and proficiently in defense of their family or their community. The third goal was everyone should have encrypted channels of communication that we can talk amongst one another should we want to talk outside of the scope of the state. And the fourth goal is we should all have a bug out plan, get the hell out of Dodge, should, should hit the fan, pardon my French. Um, so we started working towards those goals. We're still working towards our individual capacity. Um, like I said, interpersonal conflict and differences of opinion are often uh, harder to deal with than the state in many ways. Okay, so from the group of eight to 12, once you form a group of eight to 12, 
Then you begin agitating for the creation of 8 to 12 groups of 8 to 12. Now you have what I call a middle cadre, a group of 80 to 120 people. While they may not be as dedicated to one another as the initial group of 8 to 12, they're still dedicated to being there, rendering mutual aid, coming to one another's defense should they come under fire from private or public criminals alike. Then from the group of 80 to 120, we form 8 to 12 groups of 80 to 120. Now we have 800 to 1,200. And when you have 800 to 12 people, 1,200 people on the same page, uh, you can really make change. And you, some people can step outside of the box, step outside of the government box, and perhaps opt out of certain institutions. We can commit to one another to come to one another's aid. As I said before, I have two children, and uh, we don't always go along with what most in contemporary society do, for example. Uh, neither one of our children have social security numbers. We're going to give them the choice to, if they decide they want to have one or not. Thank you. And like, well, what are they going to do about bank accounts? How are they going to get a bank account? And I used to say, this was just three years ago before I heard about Bitcoin, well, there'll be some sort of technology that'll come along and we'll help to grow this technology so they don't need to have social security numbers to engage in commerce or have banking services. And sure enough, I learned about Bitcoin a couple years ago. I was like, yes, sooner than I thought. That's great. That's right. Um, so uh, we, they're not vaccinated as well, and we try to do everything that we can. But unfortunately, I've already read stories about these behaviors causing families to come under the scrutiny of the CPS, and that's probably the greatest fear I have would be my children to be taken away from me. So that's why I also looked at this idea that I would love if something, God forbid, were to ever happen like that. There's a group of 80 to 120, 800 to 1,200 people that can come to my aid that would render aid. People that are so committed to me and me so committed to them that they would put themselves in the, direct, in the, in the way of the state if they were to take me away or my children away. Form a human circle around the police call. Form a human circle around our home. Uh, these are the things that I've been thinking about, and this is the type of structure that I think could help make this a reality. Anything from someone being taken away for a victimless crime, for refusing to get a driver's license, for example. I strongly feel that if we have enough people that are willing to assert themselves through peaceful resistance, that it'll hopefully reach a point where the state just says, you know what, we should probably leave these people alone. Uh, I like to point to my good friend Antonio Beeler, if anybody's heard his case. He was arrested in December 2012, uh, in New, on New Year's Day in, in 2012. He finally faced trial, like two and a half years later, and he was found not guilty. But uh, he was there sticking up for a young woman that was being violently yanked out of a car at a DWI stop. She was the passenger. She was telling the driver not to do the test. And he started uh, basically berating the police officer. What are you doing? Why are you treating her like that? Why are you pulling out of the car like that? You don't have to do that. He said, mind your own business. Eventually, they hauled the girl around and came back and roughed my friend up. And he was arrested, originally uh, charged with felony harassment of a public official. They said he spit in his face, but that didn't end up happening. That didn't happen. Video later showed that. But what happened with Antonio is they filed the charges on him and they messed with the wrong dude because not only is, a, is he a West Point graduate, an Army Ranger, now he's graduated from Stanford and Harvard with two separate master's degrees, but he was a member of the local liberty community in Central Texas and dozens and dozens of people came to his aid and it ended up hurting the Austin Police Department more than it hurt my good friend Antonio because we put up major resistance, we started the Peaceful Streets Project, we gave out 100 cameras to low-income families, People did like weekly cop watches. They had to send out internal memos letting officers know that it is legal to film. We really did a good job to change the culture, but the point is we were persistent and we were there for one another. And I strongly believe that we have enough people that are willing to engage in that type of mutual aid and, and solidarity, then eventually it will no longer be in the interest of the man to keep harming us, especially if we get eight to 12 groups of 800 to 1200. Now we have 8,000 to 12,000 people. What if this is happening regionally? This is flourishing through Central Texas, expanding slowly but surely. They start doing something similar in the Free State Project, which already has a thousand plus liberty activists that are so dedicated that they'll pack up their lives and move all across the country. San Diego, LA have wonderful flourishing liberty communities. So does Colorado, so does Orlando, Florida. So what if these all started expanding outward? And before you know it, we have eight to 12 groups of 8,000 to 12,000. We have 80,000 to 120,000 people that are all on the same page. Now we're getting to have a larger community. Now we get into the difficulties that oftentimes people come in and insert a monopoly or a hierarchy and say, oh, it's just too big to handle. We can't organize or we can't form these uh, 
societies unless we have some sort of top-down hierarchy. Well, here's where the Bitcoin blockchain comes into play. And I've also been thinking a lot about how the blockchain technology, which is the distributed public ledger that uh, keeps track of the transactions that are taking place and the validity of those transactions, what if we could apply this type of technology to this concept of, of freedom cells, of a mutual aid society? And this could happen in that each person that forms that group of 8 to 12, one of the things that we can do is make sure everyone has a, a wallet, a public address, and a private address. And what we can do with these addresses and with these Bitcoin wallets, perhaps this could be a token built, built on top of the Bitcoin blockchain or an alternative type of cryptocurrency altogether. Nonetheless, everyone gets a token. Everyone can communicate with one another through encrypted channels. And if we have to engage in mutual aid with our group of 8 to 12, 80 to 120 or 800 to 1200, we could set up escrow accounts to help little Johnny's broken leg fund. Uh, we could also eventually, if our numbers are large enough, we could set up escrow accounts to fund uh, the acquisition of non-police cruisers. So we could have little mutual aid crews that come, come to help one another. So on top of uh, encrypted communication and the ability to transfer value amongst, amongst ourselves without the state interfering in any way, we could also do peer-to-peer consensus-based voting. And so if we have a group of 8 to 12, 800 to 1,200, and for some reason, you know, maybe we want to form a compact with the other group of 8,000 and 12,000 across the country, or we want to pull all of our resources to do something drastic that we get everyone on, on board for, uh, we can engage in this voting through the blockchain, through sending different uh, tokens to different addresses, and it can be completely audible, and you can't engage in fraud like you do with the modern voting machines. I think we could make decisions on a grand scale. And it could be consensus-based, to where if your group of 80 to 120 doesn't all have a consensus on a particular action, then they opt out of the rest of those groups that are within the 8,000 to 12,000 group. Or even down to the group of 80 to 120, if one of the groups of 8 to 12 doesn't want to participate, then they can show that through their lack of, of support through this blockchain-based system. So I strongly feel in, in doing this, we can create an environment where we're able to fulfill our common wants and needs and solve our common problems in a decentralized, distributed manner. And one thing that this will allow for is an environment where all of those people that say, well, no, anarchy doesn't work, we need to have government, that's what I was taught, that's what I learned in public school. Uh, we can say, well, actually, check out what we've been doing for the past five to six years. It's working, we're helping one another, we're doing it in a peaceful way. No one's forced to participate. And uh, I strongly believe that this could be a path towards creating liberty in our lifetime. One of the things that we're going to do in order to implement this as soon as we get back to, to Austin, we're on a Bitcoin-only road trip right now. Actually, this is day six. My wife and I and our two children who are over here. We travel from San Marcos, Texas, all the way here using Bitcoin only. We're going to go to LA next, Las Vegas, Colorado, Kansas City, and then back to San Marcos. And uh, one of the things that I want to do when we get back is start hosting a, a series of four monthly meetings to start agitating for this concept of freedom cells. And my goal is by the end of the first four months, we'll have that group of 80 to 20. I then want to have meetings every four months till we build out the group of 8,000, I'm sorry, 800 to 1,200 and take it from there. Perhaps this could go hand in hand uh, along with the Octolog concept that's being shared at this uh, conference and that was shared at last year's conference. Um, that could be one of the groups of 800 to 1200 that springs out of San Diego area or whatnot. So once we have this in place, and along with my original four concepts, the first three, which is the education and creation of alternative institutions, Freedom Cells is an alternative institution. The creation of these Freedom Cells, a distributed peer-to-peer -peer mutual aid society, an alternative form of social organization, then we can engage in diplomacy. And for those of our brothers and sisters in liberty that are in the political channels. Uh, for example, Free State Project was recently elected, like 15 liberty-minded, like-minded, maybe more. More, somewhere in the closet, I hear. Uh, that's, they're making significant changes, and that's one of the only states, perhaps one of the only political jurisdictions in the entire world that's actually reducing the size and scope of the state. But if you have friends in office, in Texas we have Representative David Simpson, if anybody remembers him, he, he's the one that put out the anti-TSA bill that would have made it illegal to do these, these unconstitutional check, uh, uh, searches. But if you have friends in, in public office, you get these friends to become advocates for the community that's largely growing. You even send diplomats that represent these groups of 800 to 1200, 80 to 120 or more. 
and they go sit and essentially negotiate. We're not going to give any get no no compromise, right? But you're talking to the state. You're talking to those that are in control of the coercive apparatus, and you're informing them that we're not going to let up. We are going to continue to peacefully resist. And I just want to start the conversation. Where is it going to end? Because we don't want to be killed. We don't want to take up arms against you. But we're not just going to be slaughtered. And we want to inform you that we're all peaceful, productive citizens. Scratch that. We're all peaceful, productive people yeah. that simply want to exist and fulfill our common wants and needs and live our own reality. And we no longer agree with the way that you're doing things. We don't agree with the murder and slaughter of brown-skinned people in the Middle East. We don't agree with locking people up for merely puffing on a plant that was totally naturally occurring. We don't agree with that. We don't want to subsidize it. We don't want to participate in it. Now, this could be the compromise. How about this for a compromise? A lot of people say, I'm an anarcho-capitalist, or I'm an anarcho-syndicalist, anarcho-communist, so on and so forth. Uh, me, I'm for anarcho-toleration, which is toleration of all forms of political philosophies that want to leave people alone and that say that you can, you can live your life how you want to live your life as long as you don't interfere with the way that I want to live my life. But taking it one step further, why should we not afford that same respect to those who feel it necessary to organize society with political hierarchies and monopolies? What if we could say, you know what, we don't want to crux, smash the state. We just want to be left alone. We don't want to participate. So for those of you who feel so insecure at the thought of 100% total freedom and the personal responsibility that comes along with that, you guys can keep your government. Just don't inflict it upon us. Don't impress it upon us. And I'll take it one step further. You know what? I go play frisbee golf every once in a while with my brother at the municipal park. I'll chip in a fee for that. I'll pay the gas tax, sure. You guys, you guys are building the roads right now. We don't have our DeLorean time machines that can fly around where we're going. We don't need roads. One day we will, but for now, I'll pay the gas tax. You know, I don't want to pay for health and human services. I don't want to pay for Obamacare. I certainly don't want to pay for the municipal police departments because I find them to be one of the most reprehensible institutions in existence, perhaps in the history of man. I don't want to fund that. I certainly don't want to pay for foreign wars of aggression. I don't want to do any of that. So we're going to be upstanding people. We're all going to be of a high moral character, and we're going to actually go out and help one another, and we're going to help those in need. And we are going to show that we're peaceful people, and if you harm us, I hope that the state loses more face, and it harms the state more than it does us. Because if we are helping one another, if we're engaging in charitable activities, then if someone gets taken away by the state, the people that are in the surrounding community will say, well, why did they take that guy away? He's been doing a red line every Sunday for the past six months. He's an upstanding guy. Then we can help to shift, turn the tide away from the state and its legitimacy. So that's essentially the concept in a nutshell. Again, freedom sells. We can all have some takeaways. If this idea resonates with people, it wouldn't be that hard. I'm sure many people may already have the thought in their head of eight to 12 people that they could associate with and form an affinity group. A small mutual aid society, an inner cadre. And then all it takes is the forums. Facebook would be a wonderful tool to agitate for the creation of 8 to 12 groups of 80 to 20. And I strongly believe once you have 800 to 1,200 people, you can really get creative in the assertion of your sovereignty. And from there, the sky's the limit. So I strongly believe that we have, we have the force of good on our side. And our ideas are right. The philosophy of liberty is consistent, it's pure, it's ethical. And so I just want everyone to know that there's strength in numbers, there's strength in unity, and there's strength in truth. And we have all three of those on our side. And all we have to do is stand up together, and there will be no holding us down. Thank you.